I want us to continue from where we stopped in the topic that had started like last week, but one on our the union for stature. What is the purpose for our union with Christ? That union is a is a means to a desired end. And Pastor told us that this union was for oneness, compatibility, function, and also strength. So I would say maybe what I'm basing uh, my ministry on this morning is on the strength. We're just trying to define this strength. How does it look like? What is it that we need so that we can grow into that stature of Christ? Amen? So for as a means of recap, I'm going to do this very, very fast. So kindly give me all your attention so that uh, for the sake of those who are not with us, so that we can be on the same page. I began by looking in the book of Luke chapter 19 and verse 12 in the KJV, where the Bible says, he said, therefore, a certain noble man went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. Yeah, and if, I, if you remember very well, we said it was, it was up to the servants to work with what they had learned for this person who had been called noble. Because you're not just called noble, you get into a place of nobility. Amen? Because of your character, because of your status in the society, and because of how you have, uh, you have revealed yourself to the people, that's what makes people call you a uh, noble person. So if you look at this story, we are talking also, it's like a, a type of Christ. Amen? It's like a type of Christ, how he's going to go, and then he has left the church to do something for him until he comes back. Amen? So this, uh, uh, these ones, they were just servants, but I said, in our case, we are not servants, but we are sons who serve their father. Amen? We are sons who serve their father. So the Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 2, the Bible says, Let a man so consider us the servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So these ones, the, the servants, now they were taking the position of stewardship because the pounds they had been given were not their pounds. These pounds belonged to somebody else. But this man had placed them in a place of stewardship. I have given you this pound and I want you to work with this pound. And when, by the time I come back, I want to find profit. Amen? So we are talking about stewardship here. And here the Bible is telling us that, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So when you're talking about stewards, uh, you, you don't give stewardship uh, to children. Amen? You, do, you didn't give your son or your daughter your car to drive this morning. You love them. You cherish them. Amen? But you know they have not reached that level in their life where you can give them stewardship. They, they, are not, they are not there yet. You love them. They are in the process. But right now, you cannot give them your title deed for them to keep because you'll find they'll, dr they'll have drawn everything on that title deed because they do not understand stewardship. So I would say that stewardship is for the mature, okay? Stewardship is for the mature. And as steward, for them to be a steward, they have to understand that the authority that they have been given. Because a steward can be given authority, but it is up to them to understand the authority that they have been given and to put into effect the authority that they have been given as a steward. Okay? And I gave an example of uh, what do these people who take care of apartments? They're called what? They are caretakers. You see, the caretakers, they have to be given authority by the owner of the apartment, but they are not the owners. But they have been given authority that if this person doesn't pay rent, by this time, you go and switch off the light. If they continue like this, disconnect the water. When they continue like this, you know, put another padlock. You understand? They have been given authority. And the, by the time they are being given authority is because the owner of the flat has considered this person mature enough. Amen? to follow the instructions that they have been given. Amen? So stewardship does not just happen. Stewardship comes with maturity. Amen? It comes with maturity. And that's why the Bible is telling us where we read that this noble man told them, occupy, because he had placed them into the position of stewardship. I have given you my money. Be good stewards 
of the money that I have given. But in Christ also, that is what he has given us. And he desires us to be good stewards over the realities of the gospel that he has made available in us, and those realities are in us. Am I speaking to someone in the house of God? So we are looking at the difference between our union with Christ, amen, and how we now grow into the stature of the one that we are in union with. Amen? The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 26, in the TPT, there is a divine mystery. We are not looking at the union because we have to understand the difference. Amen? Uh, a, great, a, a secret surprise has been concealed from the world for generations, but now it's being revealed, unfolded, and manifested to every holy believer to experience. So it is for our experience. Living within you is a Christ who floods you with the ex expectation of glory. This mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people, and God wants everyone to know it, this is the aspect of our union with Christ. Amen? Our union with Christ. And Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, And you are in him made full and having come to the fullness of life. And Christ, in Christ you too are filled with the Godhead. Somebody say, I'm filled with the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And rich full spiritual stature. And he is the head and rule and 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 he is the head of all rule and authority of every every angelic principality and power. So, if you remember when I was taking you through this teaching, I say that this reality is your spiritual stature, is who you are positionally. Are you understanding who you are positionally, as far as you are that. And the reason I'm saying it is who we are positionally is because it is the same to everyone. Are you understanding? All of us, if you are filled with God, if you are born again, you are filled with the Godhead. Okay? We are all filled with the Godhead. If you, are, if you are born again, you are filled with the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But this reality is what happened in your spirit man the day you got born again. Are you getting me, church? Are you getting me? Yeah, this is who you are positionally. Amen. Because you, your son is your son, whether you like it or not. The fact that you are the one who has brought for them forth, they are your son. I mean, you don't have to, to think twice about it, but because you are the one who has brought them forth, they are your son and they are your daughter. So this is a position that I am talking about, that if you are born again, of, if you are born of God, you are filled with the Godhead. You are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I discovered also that you can be filled with the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and still be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Amen? Because this reality happens in your spirit. Okay? It has not happened in your mind. So even if the person got saved while they were drunk, they still got filled with the Godhead. Okay? It, it, well, it, it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in church, in a crusade, you got filled with the Godhead. So this one, you being filled with the Godhead, is not a, is not a process. Okay? It is something that happened in a matter of seconds. It's something that happened the, the minute you say that, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, you got filled with the Godhead. Are you understanding? But the Bible is telling us there is another place that we walk towards. And this is a place that we talk about the stature of Christ. Are you understanding? Not receiving the stature, the manifestation aspect of the Christ reality in us. Okay, And that's where we find in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, the Bible says that, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Remember, these ones were already given not to make people have more of God, okay? But they were given to people, okay, who already had the Godhead, okay? Maybe the evangelist was to preach for them to come. 
You understand? So the teacher is to teach and the pastor is to take care of them. So the Bible is saying the reason as to why these have been given is for the equipping of the saints. So if you think that is just enough to be filled with the Godhead, then you are telling God that it is not accurate for him to have given us the five so that we can be equipped. So it means that as much as you are filled with the Godhead, there is an aspect of you being equipped. You're filled with the Godhead, but you still need to be equipped, okay? The equipping of the saints. So these saints are people who are already filled with the Godhead, okay? The saints are the ones who are already filled with the Godhead, but for the work of ministry. And this ministry is not just preaching, okay? If that's what, that was my topic today, I would have looked at it different. Because we are all in ministry. Tell your neighbor you are in ministry. Oh, yes, because that is how God desires for you to minister him in the platform that he has given you even in the marketplace, okay? So we are all ministers unto the Lord. So for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith. So this, the faith, if you remember, I, it's not the gift that you are given, the gift of faith, okay? The faith is a Christian the Christianity, what we call Christianity, the gospel of Christ, amen? The gospel, we all come into the unity as far as the gospel of Christ is concerned and to the knowledge of the Son of God, amen? So that's why they have been given these five. The Bible con continues to say, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So you see how the progression is that you come, we come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So the more you know him, okay, the more you know him, there is a, a perfecting that begins to happen. Not the perfecting in your spirit. You're already filled with the Godhead. You're already in union with Christ, okay? But remember this person that is filled with the Godhead is coming from somewhere. And God has an expectation over their lives. So God says, you know what? I know I'm going to take you on a journey. I know you are full of me, okay? I know you are full of me, but I, you, I need somebody to teach you so that you can come into the unity of the faith so that as you sit as a family as you sit as a congregation we all look at Jesus the same we all understand the gospel we understand redemption the same we understand justification the same we understand righteousness the same we don't think that righteousness is a place you get we understand that righteousness is a place we start from because it's a gift that is given to us from salvation salvation you understand justification you understand adoption are you getting me so we all come into the unity of the faith so when i say adoption what you understand adoption to be is what my sister at the back there will understand adoption to be so when we are all understanding the gospel the same way the bible says that now we come into the unity of the faith we are all reading we are all understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ the way it is supposed to be understood. Now, so when we all come to understand the gospel, the way it's supposed to be understood, this is where now the Bible says, now that we come into the unity of the faith. Are you understanding? The unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ. And if you remember, I'm still uh, on doing some, a bit of recap, I'm putting in some new things. Yeah, so when you're talking about uh, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, it means it is possible. Amen. It is possible for a person that was once a drunkard, a person that was walking in ignorance, a person that was religious at one point in their life, it is possible for this person to get to that place where the Bible says that you get to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That when we see you, we see Christ. Amen. When we see you, we see Christ. And we are not seeing Christ in the spirit. We are seeing Christ in the manifestations that are happening through your life. 
That is a stature. You cannot be able to see my spiritual stature, but you can understand my spiritual stature by the manifestations that happen through my life. But if I stand here, you may not be able to decode my spiritual stature. But through the demonstration of the Spirit, through based on how I have allowed the Word of God to work in me, how I have allowed Christ to manifest Himself through me, then you will be able to see the full stature of Christ manifested through my life. Amen. The Bible says that we should no longer be children. Remember I said stewardship is for mature people. Amen. It's for mature people. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. So the child that is being tossed to and fro is filled with the Godhead. Amen. It's filled with the Godhead. But they lack understanding. Okay, they lack understanding. They have not been able to allow themselves, they have not allowed themselves to be equipped. They have not allowed themselves to be edified by the word of God to a place where, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the Bible is saying, for this person, you know, in Christianity, you don't remain a child because you, you I mean, growth in Christianity has nothing to do with time. We have 50 year olds. 60-year-old spiritual babies. Amen. But we have 17-year-olds. We have 20-year-olds, people who have grown in the word of God. Amen. So this one has nothing to do with the, with the age. It has everything to do with how much we have submitted ourselves to the counsel of the word of God. How much have you submitted yourself? So you can find a 60-year-old person that is being tossed to and fro with every window of doctrine because they have refused to grow. Amen. They have refused to grow. But in Christianity, you have to make a choice to grow. You don't just grow. Amen. You just don't. You have to make a choice. Yeah, you have to make a choice to grow. So when you're talking about edification, Edification is when you allow yourself to be instructed. Remember, you're coming from somewhere and you are being instructed in this way. Okay, the faith is also called the way. You're being instructed in the faith. So when you're talking about edification, we are talking about instruction. And this is why many people fail because they don't want to be instructed. They want to do it how they know. Okay, but here the Bible is saying, if you want to grow into that full stature, you have to allow yourself to be instructed. So edification is instruction. You sit down and you are instructed. Uh, you are instructed. And how does the instruction come from? Now that you are born again, okay, it, all, it should always start with because it is it is the sense that I'm speaking to. Now that you are born again, so then these are the instructions. Now that you are born. Again, so that's why you find that Paul, and I said this last time, uh, as, uh, in the book of Galatians chapter 4, verse 19 to verse 20, he says, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you. And for the sake of those person who was not here, I said that this pastor, uh, Paul, this church that he was writing to, he was calling them my little children, meaning they are people who are born again. Okay? They are his little spiritual children. Okay, his little spiritual children. They were not little like little. He was not sending this letter to Sunday school. He was not sending the letter to Sunday school. No, he was sending, it was a rebuke. He was sending this letter to 30-year-olds, to 40-year-olds, to 20-year-olds, but he called them my little children, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, meaning they were, they were behaving childish. They had childish behaviors. That's why he was saying, I want to be there and change my tone because I don't like how you are behaving. But had they received Christ? Were they full of the Godhead? Were they full of the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Were they full of that? But Paul said, I want to come. And I want to change my tone because I do not see the stature. I don't see the demonstration 
of what you have received on your inside. I don't see the demonstration of the Godhead in your lives. So he said, I want to come and I want to change my tone. And I'm not coming to pat your back. I am coming with a very sharp rebuke. Because how can, you de how can your manifestations be so different from what you received? There has to be a demonstration of the realities that you have Received, So you find that this, the reason as to why God has given us the fivefold is not for us to be saved. One of, the, of course we get saved, you understand. But for the church is to do something else. For us to get into that stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen? So I, I'm saying this to say that uh, when, when I understood this, when I understood this, I, I began to understand that... Uh, it is, it is uh, improper, okay? It is improper. It is uh, unbiblical. It is anti-grace. See anti-grace. See anti and it was grace. I'm saying it is anti-grace anti for you to just call yourself human. The human is a natural man who does not have the life of God in them. But this notion has been sold to us so much that we incline so much towards our humanity more than we incline ourselves towards our spirituality. So you find somebody, they really don't want to live their life according to who they are spiritually, and they say, you know what, me, I'm just human. Me, I am not just human. I am a partaker of the divine nature. And you are a partaker of the divine nature. So if you are a partaker of the divine nature, then you cease to, to be just human. Anybody who looked at Jesus, because Jesus was born a Jew, anybody who looked at him with carnal eyes, he was just another Jewish man. But anybody who could have been spiritual that time would know that Jesus was not just human. And whatever made him who he was is what has been given to the church. You understand? If I was to look within you, there is, a there is a serious difference between you that is born again and, and a person that is not born again. But on the outside, we might just be deceived because we look the same. Because the day you got born again, you did not darken, you did not brighten, you did not become tall. You just re remained the way you are. But inside of you, there is a totally different... You are so different. Within you is God. Are you understanding? You are full of the Godhead. So you cannot be full of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and still call yourself a mere human. You are not a mere human. Amen. You are a, you are a person that has a physical body that carries God. Amen. But I am not just human. No, I carry divinity on my inside. Yeah, I am a carrier of the Godhead. So when you're now talking uh, about the union, we say the union, the purpose for the union is for stature. So it's very important for us to understand this union, for you to know you are who you are on the inside. Are you getting me, church? And then the Bible says, now, based on that reality, now God desires stature out of your life. So well, how now do we get? Because I said it is a process. Okay? It is, and God is not the one who determines how fast the process runs. You are the one who determines how fast the process runs. I say it, this is for the sake of example. When this Mose was born, and when Dixon was born, maybe, just maybe, Mose could have weighed more than Dixon. You think this guy was born like this? No. He was a small, he was a very small baby. So when both of them were small, I mean they were the same, isn't it? They were both boys with potential. Okay? They were both boys with potential. I promise you guys, if this Moses, I feed him well. You know, the, the dude is not married, so we understand, okay? So, if I was to feed him well, you know, like the brown ugali, you know, 
and the managus. Are you understanding? And then he eats very well, and he hits the gym. There is the aspect. No, this is a process. Okay, he has to hit the. He has to hit the gym, and he hits the gym. I promise you. You see this Moses that you are seeing here. He has the potential to be like Dixon. He has potential. I promise you. He has potential to become like. He has the potential to become like Dixon. Everything that is in Moses is in Dixon because they are both men. Okay, whatever is in him is also in. So there is nothing that is added in Dixon that is not there in Moses. Okay, but there is something that has happened to Dixon that Moses needs to learn. <laughs> you see, that's why I will not have asked anyone. As it, as it okay, church, I know somebody who, is, who won't get offended. Are you understanding? <laughs> yeah, so this guy, he has the potential to become like Dixon, okay? So when I said that we are full of the Godhead, this is what I meant. Whatever is in him is whatever is in him. But you see now, if I wanted this, this speaker lifted, okay, when I ask Dixon to, to lift it, I don't think twice. Do you know, actually, he carries this thing like a baby. And as Bebanga, wah. <laughs> after, after service, he doesn't carry like this. He carries like, I mean, so, because when I look at him, I see now it's not just potential. Now there is a stature. So if I need human power, I'm not going to call Moses. But for worship, present worship, I will call Moses. <laughs> Amen. For vocals. This guy, but then this guy can sing, eh? Oh, he's here. Yeah, he has a voice. So if I want anything that needs human power, I will not go for Moses. Because I, I, I will not, I won't be fair. But if I go for Dixon, and I tell him, you know what, Dixon, I need that thing to be lifted. I don't even have to think twice. Because when I look at him, I don't see just potential. I see stature. So I know with this stature, if he's not able to lift this, this is called a what? Monitor. Then there is some, then his stature is lying. His stature, if I ask him to carry this and he's struggling, then this is fake. But if his stature is real, which it is, if I ask him to carry that monitor, the guy will just lift it like a piece of bread. Because within him, he has developed himself to that, to that stature where now he can be able to occupy as far as human strength is concerned. I promise you, you don't need to pray. It is evident. Praise God. It's not an issue of faith. It is evident that this man has grown himself in muscle stature. Are you understanding? Muscle stature. And that is what I'm talking about when we are talking about our union. The union was who they were when they were young. They were all the same. Are you understanding? But now to get into this physical stature, there was a process. Are you understanding? There was a process. And this man went through the process, which I believe Moses will start. Amen. <laughs> so that you can get there. And I, I tell you, getting Jim is good. You know, when you look at him, it's nice. He looks like, you know, you see when I walk, you, I walk with him. You know, when you're walking with this guy, you don't even go speaking in tongues. <laughs> because when people see you, they cross the road. Are you understanding? <laughs> they just cross the road. Because there is a manifestation. Are you understanding? So it is the same thing. But how, if you have ever tried to go to the gym, it's not a nice place. You know, the thought of going to the gym makes you to pull the covers over your head. Are you understanding? But this man refused to pull the covers over his head. He was like, that is what I want to see. And me seeing this thing will not just happen in bed. Me to see these muscles being manifested, I have to go to the gym. And let me tell you, gym, sometimes they do things. Eh? They tell you to do things and you feel you, you almost hate the instructor. You don't feel they are sent by God. 
Because they tell you things that makes you discover muscles that you never thought existed. Yeah, and after they have taken you through gym, the following day, you wake up, you know, you, you, coming out of the bed is a process. You know, when you're walking up the stairs, you, can, you can't walk up the stairs without holding to the rail. Because your feet are telling you you're not going anywhere. Because of what happened to the feet. Are you understanding? So what am I saying? It has not just happened by default. It has to be something that you do, and the process is not easy. The process is not easy. There has to be devotion. There has to be commitment. And then he has to know what muscles, what do I need to lift to exercise this muscle? What, what do I need to lift to exercise this muscle? And then how, if I start with five, if I go to ten, okay, then you know the muscle is still growing, okay? So if you stay at ten, you can only lift up to to 10. But if you want the muscles to grow, you have to go beyond 10 and continue to grow. Amen? You go to 10, you go to 15. You know, pastor lives 15 and 15. Hallelujah. Amen. So you, you, but you don't begin there. You begin at 5. Praise the name of Jesus. So what am I saying? And I, I, I put this here so that it can stay in your mind. That getting to have this stature does not just happen. But him being a man just happened. So they are both men. But this one, there is something he has worked on. And it's the same thing in the body of Christ. We are all believers. We are all born again. We are all full of the Godhead. But the stature of Christ is different. The stature, how we manifest Christ is different. Praise the name of Jesus. And that is what I want us to look at this time. Because Jesus is not coming for a weak church. Jesus is coming for a strong church. He, he, has, he, has, uh, he has desired for us to occupy until he comes. He wants us to occupy. He wants us people to look at us and know that we are real Christians. Are you understanding? So can you appreciate them even as they have their seats? In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So what, when you're talking about stature, remember now you're full of the Godhead. So I, I won't be able to look at everything. I'll look at what time will allow. And then uh, the rest you will, you will catch in the spirit. Praise the name of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, so how does it begin? It's a process. I said last time that first it's how you receive the word. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stay there for long. How do you receive the word? How? How do you receive the word? Okay, because I know there are people here, they have not heard anything. They're just looking at my outfit. That will not help you. It's only that you could sing a Are you understanding? But seriously, the only thing that can be able to change your life are the words that are coming from my mouth. Amen. So consider the words that are coming from my mouth because how you receive the word of God, how you welcome the word of God, is what makes the difference in your life. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I love this scripture and it has helped me a lot. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So the effectiveness of the word of God in your life is based on how you receive it. And I say last time, it's not, how, it's not your attitude when you get to church. This begins with your attitude while you're in the house. When you're preparing yourself to come to church, what is your attitude as you prepare yourself to come to church? Are you expectant in your heart? Do you know that you're, do you have this thing within you that I am going to church to be changed? I am going to church to listen to the word of life. I am going to church to learn something that maybe I do not know as yet. So what is your attitude as you're coming to church? Do you come to church because it's good for a Christian to come to church on a Sunday morning? But do you, or do you come to church with, with a heart that is welcoming the word of God? Because the effectiveness of the word of God in your life is determined by how you welcome the word. Amen. How, how, do you welcome the, how do you welcome the word of God? Do you see it as life? Or do you just see it as something that pastor has to do on a Sunday morning? How do you welcome the, 
the word of God, how you welcome it, determines how it works in your life. So anytime you receive the word of God, you receive it with appreciation. You know, you receive it with an open heart. You receive it with a heart that is willing to be instructed. Remember edifying with a heart that is willing to be instructed. Praise the name of Jesus. So it matters how you receive the word of God. And it's a, how, how you receive the word of God, church, now be, determines how you, your mind begins to change. Because your, the, the change of your mind has not, God has not provided for us another means of changing our mind other than through the word of God. The Bible is telling us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now I begin to what I need to talk about today. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to verse 6 in the TPT. In the TPT. The Bible says, for although we live in the natural realm. Amen. We don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons as much as we live on the earth, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. Are you getting me? Our spiritual weapons, and we all know that the spiritual weapons is the word of God. Are you understanding? So as it were right now, I'm in a spiritual warfare. You thought spiritual warfare deals with what? It's nothing on top of a mountain. It's what is between your ears. That's what is where spiritual warfare happens. Amen? So the Bible is saying our spiritual weapons, they are spiritual. Jesus speaking, he said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit. And they are life. So for us to overcome in this warfare, it has everything to do with words. <laughs> to do with words. Our spiritual weapons are energies with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. So people have defenses, you know. They, they, they hide they, they hide behind some defenses. People hide and say, you know what, the reason as to why I am angry like this is because of the tribe I come from. That is a defense you're trying to hide yourself behind. Yes, you're saying, you know what, the reason as to why I treat my wife like this is because I, I, I had a, a tough childhood. Who told you ours was easy? It's because of how it's a defense. You, you don't want to deal with it, but you're hiding yourself behind this. It's a, this defense. You're using this defense as a way of hiding yourself from facing the reality that you can be able to overcome it. Because we are talking about getting into the full stature of Christ. The reason as to why Jesus did what he did is because Jesus had no arguments. He had no arguments from within him. That is why, that's the reason as to why faith flowed easily. Because the, the faith of God was not finding any arguments in the mind of Christ. But now because of where we are coming from, there are some arguments that we really need to deal with. And here the Bible is telling us that there are some defenses that we hide ourselves behind because we do not want to grow ourselves into the full stature of Christ. Because this one, like I said, in the case of Dixon, did not just happen. He had to wake up one day and decide, I'm going to hit the gym because I want to grow my muscles. So if you want to grow into the full stature of Christ, you have to get out of the defenses that you hide. Those defenses that you hide yourself behind. No, get out. Praise the name of Jesus. Don't say I was raised, I was raised by a single mother because I was raised by a single mother. I cannot be able to do one, two, three, four. That is a defense. If I was a natural man, then it would not be a defense. But now because I'm not a natural man, my war, whatever I am doing is not natural. It is spiritual. It has its genesis in Christ, not in my generation, not in where I am coming from. It has its reality in Christ. So the Bible is saying the reason as to why our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power, it has a purpose. To effectively, def to effectively dismantle the defenses. Effectively. But do you know that effectiveness does not just happen because God desires? That effectiveness happens because you are working together with God. 
Why you tell God, you know what? God, I was raised bitter. I was raised angry. I was raised like this. But God, I refuse to hide, my, to hide myself behind this defense. And say, that is why I don't love people because I was not loved. That's why I don't embrace people because I was not embraced. Now, that is a defense that you are trying to, to hide yourself behind. But the word of God is here to dismantle that defense. You can do all things through Christ. Amen. Not through where you are coming from. Because I, I, I promise you, I promise you, I, I, I so promise you, I am so tired sometimes. I am so tired of a 40-year-old man behaving funny because of where they came from. Then what difference has, does Jesus make in your life? Because every time that you're going before, you think, God, it's because of my father. Sometimes, let your father rest in peace. Allow your father to be. Amen? And take it upon yourself. I said it's a personal responsibility. Just like Dixon, nobody would have gymed on his behalf for him to have muscles. He had to go to the gym himself. So for you, you have to engage with the word of God. And you say, God, I, I, I was raised bitter, but the Bible says that you have put your love in my heart. So I, 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 this, the love of God that is resident within me is what is going to reign in my life. That way you are dismantling the things that you are trying to hide behind. So you come here, you be, begin to beat your wife. And you say, I have anger issues. Where did you get that from? Because it's not from Christ. It's a defense. And then why are you angry? You begin to say, me, me, where to? Uh, where I come from, you are angry. Uh, as we fight and then we sit down to reason after. Okay. That's where you, that was before Christ. After Christ. It's not whether you are a Kikuo or a Luo. Now you are in Christ. How do people in Christ behave? How do people in Christ behave? Do people in Christ beat on their wives? So don't tell me it's where I am coming from. I, I, even, even my father. You are not your father. You are, if, 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 if there is any fatherhood we are talking about, let's talk about God. God does not abuse his children. So you should also not abuse his children and your wife happens to be one of his children. Oh yes, God does not abuse. Amen. So your wife happens to be a child of God. And God does not abuse his children. So don't tell us, don't hide behind that defense that it is because I was raised like this. No. Then what difference has Jesus made in your life? If you are still hiding behind a defense, then what difference has Jesus made? That means the, the, this Jesus is a good story. There is no reality in it. Then you are not a new creation. The old things have not passed away in your life. Because if all things have passed away and new things have come, we should be start to see a new you. Amen. We should start to see a new you. So what am I saying? Because everything in your life begins with how you think. Are you understanding? So the Bible is saying that you, there are defenses that you have created in your mind that results into you acting in a certain way. Okay? So those defenses is what you deal with by the word of God. And the Bible of God, the word of God is saying that this divine power, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a power of God. You understand? The gospel of Jesus is a power of God. So meaning you can use the gospel. You can use the word of God to dismantle the defenses that have been resident in your mind for years and years. Okay? So from today, we refuse for you to hide behind the defenses. No, we, we are growing to the stature of Christ. We are growing and you cannot grow into the stature of Christ if you, are, if you continue giving excuses. You cannot grow into the stature of Christ when you still continue giving reasons as to why you behave the way you, ha you behave. You have to get to a place and know I am taking charge of my mind. You take charge of your mind to dismantle those defenses. The Bible says so that we can demolish every deceptive fantasy. Every deceptive you know, fantasies are those things that you think, they are not godly. They are not godly, they are fantasies. But if I was to see, 
Those fantasies, I will be shocked because they don't look like Christ. They don't look like Jesus. So the Bible is saying, because I need to continue, the Bible say, is telling us so that we can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude. Ar the attitude has its genesis in how you think. Your attitude has everything to do with how you think because how you think shapes your attitude. Yeah? So the Bible is saying that... Uh, you break through through every arrogant. You know, it is arrogant because it's against the word. Okay? That's what, that's what qualifies it to be called arrogant. It is arrogant because it's not in line with the word of God. Okay? That attitude. If it is not in line with the word of God, it's an arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance to the true knowledge of God. We capture. This is your responsibility. Remember? Remember Dixon had to go to the gym? Okay, we, we capture like prisoners of war. You know, prisoners of war are not captured nicely. They're not, you know what? It's not like the way, the, not, not, not cops in Kenya, but there's some cops in the US or some other nations. They tell you, now I have to arrest you. And whatever you say right now can and will be used against you in the court of law. Hallelujah. We are still to get there. <laughs> Praise God. So the prisoners of war are not arrested like that. As you see now, I have to arrest you because you're a prisoner of war. No, I have to take you and take you to my nation so that you become our slave. No. Prisoners of war, they are taken by force. Because who wants to be taken a prisoner? They fight. Amen. Because they know the consequences of them being captured. So there is no prisoner of war that just goes. They, by the time they are captured, they have fought and fought and fought until they cannot fight again because these other people are more powerful than them. But they just don't go and allow these people to capture them. They fight for it. And that is why I'm saying it is an argument. There is a part of your mind that is telling you it is justifiable for you to do this. But you tell that mind, no, the word of God says I should do Otherwise, so the Bible is saying, just like they are there, they, they are they are captured by force. Now you take your mind by force and you dictate to your mind, and you tell your mind, This is how you're going to think, and this, this, this is how you're going to think. And now, here you're not using emotions, you are telling your mind, The Bible has told me that every uh, my, my thought should be noble, uh, my thoughts should be truth. Are you understanding? So, anytime you think a lie, you tell your mind, That is not noble. What is noble is what the Bible says about this, because whatever thought that comes your, into your mind. There is a corresponding word that God has given you to use against it. Anytime you feel like you want to you, you, you wanna hit your wife, there's a word that says, love your wife as Christ. Love the church. So when you're doing like this and you remember, love your wife as Christ, love the church. So the, the arm will not go down, but you will hug her and tell her, you are difficult, but I still love you. The hand will not go down, <laughs> but it will still go, it will be on her, but not with force, but with tenderness. You are telling, you tell her, you know what? God is exercising patience. I have patience. I have patience. You know, as, as you're parting, you know, within you, you're boiling. You know, within you, 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 you within you want to squeeze it to a place of pain. You understand? But because you know you're supposed to love, the, you have to love your wife as, you, as Christ loved the church. You're telling you, you know what, girl, you know what, you know what, baby girl? Oh, patience is working, it's good in my life. Oh, I am a very patient man. I am a very loving man. All this time, what you know you're speaking, you're speaking faith. Because if you are to go to your emotions, the things you do are not very good. But now you are taking your mind captive. You are making me say this, but I'm not going to say it. I am going to do what the word of God says. So the Bible is saying, that's why I said it's a place of thought. The Bible is saying we capture like prisoners of war every thought. You know, some of you, you're in church, but the things that are going through your mind. Eh? Some of you even don't, they're thinking, why, why, is she, why is this girl shouting so much? I mean, you're all thinking different things. 
Are you understanding? The Bible is saying that you take every thought and insist. You have to insist. You have to insist. You take that thought and insist that it bows in obedience to the anointed one. You take that thought. You know that thought? That, that is a thought of anger. Okay? That, that thought that is causing you to come to a place where you want to revenge. You know that thought that is giving you, making you feel like you don't want to love that person anymore. The Bible is telling us, you take that thought and insist. You thought you have to bow. I don't have the capacity to hate because I have Christ in me. And he is love. And because he is love, I don't have the capacity. Even if I wanted to hate, I don't have the capacity to hate. Then you are insisting. Because if you do not insist, the initial thought is going to run the day. It's going to run the day if you do not insist. So the Bible is saying that you have to insist. That you know what? I'm going to love that brother. And I'm not using, I'm not using force to love him. Because the love of Christ has been spread abroad in my heart. So I'm just going to exercise that love. He has hurt me. I, I think this, I don't think I've been hurt this much. But God, the Bible has told me that you are within me is the love of God. So I'm going to love that brother. I am going to love that. Now you are insisting. The Bible is telling us that you have to insist that that thought bows in obedience. But many times we allow our thoughts to just run. If you allow your thoughts to just run, the places your thoughts are going to take you will lead you to depression. But if you don't want to be depressed, you know the people who are depressed, they have just allowed their thought process to go haywire. Because it all starts in their thoughts. But if you want to live a victorious life, you have to be that Christian that always takes every thought captive. And you put it to the obedience. And it's not the obedience of Christ, the Jewish man. It's obedience to the word of God. What does the word of God say about that? What does the word of God say about that? Amen? Since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish every trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. You know that thought? You know that thought? That now the... the if you, you feel a pain in your body, and now the devil begins to tell you how sick you are, amen, you have to take that thought, and you tell that thought, listen, I have the life of God in me, and this life of God in me is not for fun. This life of God in me is to give life, is to energize my mortal body. So now you are taking that thought by force and you are insisting and let me tell you church if you insist until now that evil thought obeys to the thought that has its genesis in the word of god amen the bible says that now you are ready to punish that rebellion because sickness is rebellion sickness is rebellion i'm saying again Sickness is rebellion. It is not in line with the word of God for your life. So, but when you take that word of God, you say it today, your body still continues to misbehave. You say it tomorrow, your body still continues to... I'm telling you, you say it until that rebellion is broken. You speak it until that rebellion is broken. You speak it until that rebellion is broken. And now your body chooses complete obedience. Because of the word that you have spoken to it, you tell it, my body, you carry God. From your head, you carry God in your spirit. Every member of your body, every part of your body is a member of Christ. You speak to it until now your body begins to obey. You speak to it because your words, the, the words that you speak, they are life. That is why I'm saying after you have received the word, how you, after you have welcomed the word, now you have to allow the word of God to shape your imagination. You have to allow it to shape your imagination because the outcome of your life is based on your predominant thoughts. What are the thoughts that keep on running in your life? Maybe some of you, the things that you are going through, they are self-fulfilled prophecies. Nobody prophesied, but you thought about it. You did not insist against that thought. Now you have become a self 
fulfilled prophecy. But you can break it. You can break it. You can break it. You can tell God it was in ignorance. Now I begin to insist. Yeah, you began to say, why I'm hitting 40? Now go to diabetes in the oil. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, you're prophesying against yourself. You are born of God. That should not be something that you even think about. Because you are born of? Because you are born of God. So it shapes. The, the, the word of God that you have welcomed now begins to shape your imagination. Somebody say your imagination. The Bible says in the book of 1 John 3, 3, in the TPT, and all those who focus their hope on him will always be purifying themselves, just as Jesus is pure. You see, the more you focus on the word of God, amen? You know, meaning to purify yourself, it's, this purification is not in the spirit. You're already pure. You remember, you are filled with the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's not, it has nothing to do with your spirit man. But now, there are many things that come into your Mind, their suggestions, the devices of the enemy, the schemes of the enemy. He first begins to throw them in your mind. So the Bible is saying, if you continue focusing on Jesus, he continues to purify your soul. Amen. And as he's purified, the word of God is purifying your soul. You begin to see yourself as you, who you are in Christ Jesus. So if you want to be pure... Not pure in the state of being born again, but pure in your imaginations. Are you understanding? Because when your imaginations are pure, you begin to see life from the perspective of the word of God. That's how you begin to see life. Amen? So we are looking at the... I'm going to look at one. Then the others you're going to catch in the spirit. Amen? The Bible tells us... Have you, have you got anyone that one of the aspect of imagination? God is not in charge of your imagination. You are. Tell your neighbor you are in charge of your imagination. No, okay, you have told your neighbor now, tell yourself, I'm in charge, I'm in charge. of my imagination. Because as a man thinketh, so is he. Praise the name of Jesus. So the other one is, uh, let's go to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 31. Okay, let's start with, uh, that's verse uh, 31. Let's start somewhere from 28. Uh, God has placed in the church the following, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then those with gifts of miracles, gifts of divine healings, gifts of revelation, knowledge, gifts of leadership, amen? And gifts of different kinds of tongues. Let's continue. Not everyone is an apostle or a prophet or a teacher, not everyone performs miracles, okay? Or has a gift of healing or speaks in tongues or interprets tongues. But you should all constantly boil over with a passion in seeking the higher gifts, okay? In seeking the, the higher gifts. And it's good for you to just read that chapter. And now I will show you a superior way to live that is beyond comparison. So here if you read that chapter, uh, Paul is telling us, there is a better way. There is a better way of living that is beyond the higher gifts. There's a better way. Okay? So, he was saying that uh, if you let's go back there. He's saying that there is a better way. So he's saying now there are those that God has given. Okay? Speaking in tongues, leadership. Are you understanding all these gifts? And then Paul poses. And he says, now that you know, now I have, a sh I have, now I will show you a superior way to live that you cannot compare with speaking in tongues. Okay? You cannot compare with prophecy. You cannot compare with the working of miracles as much it is as they are all God given. They are all God given given you understand so this is not to say that what god has given is less but he's saying but there's a better way there is i want to show you a superior way to live that is beyond i mean you cannot compare this to any meaning be, what was behind in there be up there you could compare it to something else but he's saying this one you cannot compare to the prophecy, you cannot compare to the working of miracles, you cannot compare to different types of stance, you cannot even compare to the gifts of leadership. Let's go. Remember now, let's go to First Corinthians. You see now, we are the ones, the ones who did the scholars, 
are the ones that separated the chapters for the sake of reference. But when Paul was writing these letters, it was one long letter. So it, this is just a continuation of verse 31. Okay? It's not something a different letter. It's a continuation. So now he continues to say, this is a superior way. Okay? This is a superior way that cannot be compared to any other. If I were to speak with eloquence in earth, in earth many languages, and in the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I did express myself with love. And that's what apparently, that's what Pastor was talking about this morning. He was saying, you could do this. You could speak with eloquence in arts many languages. You can learn them in all our lands, man, many languages, and in the heavenly tongues of angels. Yet I did not express myself with love. My words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging symbol. You see now, this, you see now when you're prophesying, when you're speaking in those, in those eloquent languages, you're mesmerizing us. We are clapping. You're saying, man, this is so awesome. You know, this person is speaking with the, with the, with the angels, I mean with the tongues of the angels. I mean here on the earth, oh, we, we are so amazed. But before God... The Bible says you sound hollow. If you speak in tongues but you don't have love, before God you are hollow. And the church went quiet. Because we have sought for this, but we have not looked at the one that is higher, the one that cannot be compared to the speaking in tongues. And they did not express. So it is possible for you to speak in tongues, but you don't express yourself in love. It is possible for you to speak in eloquence, but you don't express yourself with love. Then my words will be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging symbol. So what am I saying? That is how we express grace. Grace is expressed. When spoken, uh, grace edifies when it, it flies in the wings of grace, in the wings of love, not in the wings of knowledge. Because knowledge puffs up. You see, grace is not us telling people what they don't know that we know. Because grace that edifies flies on the wings of grace. So here the Bible is telling us that you could be so endowed, you know, you could be so gifted, you could be speaking in tongues until you shock us. But if this is not done with love, before God you are making noise. You are making noise. Amen. Let's continue. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy, with a profound understanding of God's hidden secrets. And if I possessed an ending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that could move mountains but never learned to love, then I am nothing. You are not nothing to us. Because we are enjoying the prophecy. You're not nothing to us. No, because you're telling us the hidden secrets of God. But before God, before God, the Bible says you are nothing. Even with your deep understanding of spiritual things, even with your gift of prophecy, even if you know my phone number, even if you know where I come from, but then some of these things are not prophecy, yeah? Let me just help you. The Bible says the testimony of Christ is a spirit of prophecy. It's a spirit. It all talks about Jesus. Okay? So being told where you are coming from, there's no prophecy about that. There's nothing prophetic. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. The Bible says you are, and now I understand, honey. We are now Jesus in that last day. There are those who came and told him, we prophesied in your name. We performed miracles in your name. We did wonders in your name. And Jesus will tell, will tell them, it has not happened. 
we are still enjoying their gifts now. But a day will come when they will have to stand in the presence of the one who matters. And he will tell them, get out of here, you workers of lawlessness. But they prophesied to us. But they spoke in tongues. Amen. This is where, this is where I'm saying, I know I understand where this is coming from. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Because if you were in union with me, you'd have walked in love. Do you know, when I'm talking about union here, I'm not saying knowing about Jesus. Union here is being one with Christ. One with Christ. So that what is in Christ begins to be manifested through you. You can never walk in the consciousness of Christ and you don't walk in love. So he's saying, you use the gifts that I gave you, but you are not in union with me. Because gifts are not a sign of maturity. Gifts are not a, a qualification of the full stature of Christ. You can be walking in gifts, but you are a baby. It's a gift, remember? It's a gift. It's a gift. So you can be having a gift, but you have not feel full, you have not reached to the full stature of Christ. Because the highest way that you show your full stature in Christ is walking in love. Not prophesying. And there's nothing, even prophecy has its part. You remember it's all God given. So I'm not disqualifying that. I'm not saying they are not important. But I'm saying God is telling us because he desires for us to reach to that full stature. So Jesus prophesied. Do you know the times that Jesus prophesied? But he did it with love. You understand? He healed but out of compassion. But some heal just to exercise a gift. You understand? Not from the basis of compassion. The Bible says, Ah, let's go to verse 3, see if that's where we're going to end now. In, in, and if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I owned to feed the poor and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the poor motive, pure motive of love, I will gain nothing of value. But here on the earth, you're going to clap for you. Here on the earth, you're going to say, oh my God, they're called philanthropists. Oh, this person is such a giver. But my question is, before God, have you gained anything? This is, not a, this is not a service that you want to entice anyone. This is a service that people need to grow. You understand, we're coming to the full stature of Christ. We have the Godhead. You understand? But even as much as you have the Godhead, the Bible is telling us, even if you are to give, become the biggest giver. But if you are not doing that from love, the Bible says you would gain nothing, nothing of value. But clapping will make you feel good. But before God, you will not gain anything of value. So even when you are giving in church, don't give to be known. Give because you love. That love be the basis of your giving. Because when you give with love as a basis, then your giving is accepted by God. But here he's saying, even if you were to give everything, now you are, even, you are beyond your car, you are beyond your house, you are beyond your money, now you are saying, take my body and burn it. I want to be, you know, like a living sacrifice, like for real. <laughs> I want to offer myself as a burnt sacrifice, you know, like for real. The Bible says even if you are to offer your body and it is burnt, if there is no love, if the pure motive is not love, the Bible says then you gain nothing of value. My desire is that I gain something of value from God. I don't want the accolades of men. I don't want to be appreciated by men because I am on the earth just for a moment. When I am done with my purpose, when rapture happens, because I'm here at rapture, because I come Bali, I'm a una panga kwenda. Amen. I'm here until rapture happens. 
When I go before the Lord, he will tell me everything that you did. You did it with love. Because God is love. So anything that is done outside love, God does not recognize. And it will be a bad thing for you to have given in the house of God. But it all ends in the basket. It will not be like you have given to God because before it gets to God, the motive of your heart is what it precedes your giving. Your service, your motive of love is what precedes your service. Why are you serving God? Why are you serving God? I mean, you cannot impress him because the gifts that you are using are his. So we are not here to impress him. You cannot impress God with your singing. I cannot impress God with my preaching because I did not ever know that I was going to be a preacher. I mean, so I have nothing to impress him with. Are you understanding? But he's saying, before God, as we are growing into the full stature of Christ, people get it. Get it. As you are growing into the full stature of Christ, one of the factors is our motive. Why do you do it? Is it love? Or is it for show? Oh, God's reward system is not like man's. Amen? So for us to get, we have everything that God tells us to do. Everything that God desires from us has to have the motive of love. Even your prayer. Before Father, you say Father in the name of Jesus. He wants to know why are you praying? Why do you want that thing so badly? What is your motive? Why do you want it? Motive is key. Because Jesus said, I am on the earth to do my Father's will. That is a motive of love. I am on the earth to do my Father's will. And I pray, because I am done, that that is going to be your motive, that I am on the earth to do my Father's will. With the same attitude, with the same mentality, with the same mindset that Jesus had when he came here on the earth. You can never reach the full stature of Christ if you are not a person that walks in love. And God expects us to walk in love in this fallen world, surrounded by people that are unlovable. But he says, walk with what I have already given you. Walk in love. So those are the two things that I have captured today. How you receive the word of God. How you allow it to affect your imagination. And then walking in love. The Paul has told us there is a better way. There is a superior way that cannot be compared to any gifting. And that is walking in love. Whatever you do, do it with love in the name of Jesus.